right, friends, and the last piece of housekeeping before we kick off here, I'm going to read a little disclaimer to uh, <laughs> set the tone, let's say, for the webinar. The information in this webinar is a general description from SFOX only. Before acting on any information, you should consider the appropriateness of it as it applies to your particular objectives, financial situation, and needs, and seek advice accordingly. No information set out in this webinar constitutes legal advice, an advertisement, an invitation, a confirmation, an offer, or a solicitation to buy or sell any security or other financial credit or lending product, or to engage in any investment activity or an offer of any banking or financial service. With that, friends, panelists, everyone else, I wanna welcome you to another uh, SFOX webinar, the second edition of our Asset Allocators in Crypto series, where we leverage the SFOX community and all of the thoughtful experts working in different aspects of crypto and asset management to come and share their perspective on what it looks like to invest in crypto uh, as an asset class in 2023, what that takes, how sophisticated it is, what connections there are with other asset classes, uh, how it can be used in a portfolio, what service providers are required or useful, and really everything in between. Today, the title of our webinar is How to Build and Trade Value in Crypto on an Institutional Scale. And I am so honored to be able to welcome our esteemed panelists. We have from the SFOX side, Jack Finio, our head of product, and we're joined uh, by two of the leaders and thinkers, uh, I would say really leaders in, institu in institutional crypto investing period, um, but also two of the leaders at Hyperion Decimus. We have Chris Sullivan, Principal and Portfolio Manager, and Matt Rosen, the COO. Uh, so gentlemen, I want to welcome you all. Really excited to talk with you uh, about a wide range of topics pertaining to crypto investment and investment more broadly. Uh, but I'd love if we could kick things off just by you three giving a brief introduction of yourselves and what it is that you do and why you're doing this today. Sure, I'll, I, okay, I'll kick it off. Um, you know, we we have a pedigree from the traditional space, specifically in, in vol trading and, and systematic and quantitative trading. Um, kind of a, a a really epiphany led pathway to jumping all in from a um both practical standpoint and business standpoint uh, we can dive into that a little bit later but you know we're, we're one of the eldest hedge funds in the space I, I don't admit our ages but yeah you know relatively new space but um to us you know the time warp of 24 7 makes it seem like it's five years six years is 50 years but um yeah, we most of the folks in the space that have survived have a good TradFi background and pedigree, and and we, we've done that um, most of our careers until this beautifully awesome entrepreneurial activity. And uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, and uh, I've been uh, CEO and co-founder of Hyperion Decimus. Um, we founded the firm in 2017. We had clients in our traditional asset management practice coming to us like. What is Bitcoin? What is crypto? And so we did about a year and a half deep dive into everything Bitcoin and crypto and arrived at Hyperion Decimus and uh, launched the Libertas Fund in 2018 and been loving it ever since. So, Excellent. Thanks, guys. And then, yeah, I'll round it out. Uh, Jack Finio here, head of product at, at SFOX. As I mentioned, Aaron, i uh, been with the firm for you know, just over a few years now. Uh, but I've been in the crypto space for quite a while. Uh, prior to joining SFOX, founded a quant systematic fund focused on uh, crypto assets. Um, and then even before that, too, uh, at another company, you know, uh, actually working on somewhat of a very, very early NFT platform. Uh, so, yeah, I've been, been in the space since 2015. Uh, I've loved all of the ups and downs and very excited to, uh, to jump in with you, Chris and Matt. Thank you. Happy to be here. Agreed. I'm excited to jump in too, uh, to manage the expectations of everyone in the audience. We're probably going to be uh, having the benefit of some great conversation for the better part of the full hour here. Um, but I know I speak for uh, our panelists when I say that we're all really eager for some Q&A with the audience. So the Q&A box should be open throughout the entire talk. Uh, if you find yourself curious about a particular topic, Please, uh, I will remind and bully you throughout the hour, uh, but don't hesitate to reach out uh, and put a question into the box. We will try to weave those questions into the conversation uh, as we go through things here. 
But to set the tone a bit more, and Chris, you began to broach this a little bit, I'd love if you could give uh, our audience more of an introduction into Hyperion. Um, obviously, you're engaged in crypto. That's why you're here. But maybe give us a picture of the overall asset classes that you look at, the strategies you employ, uh, and why it is that you choose the tax that you do from a fund perspective. Mm -hmm. So the the firm is a, a collection. We call it our, our family, but a, a collection of specific disciplines with, uh, within trading. We have uh, one of our co-founders, Hong Bodek, who basically birthed the HFT movement in 97 at Blair Hall, uh, Rishi Narang, who birthed the Sadar movement at Goldman in 2002. Uh, and then we have uh, Camilla and Jeffrey, who are CS freaks, basically, and, and then our heavy heavy L1, heavy DeFi uh, since inception, essentially. And so the 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 fund is designed as all weather, but it, re it reflects the alphas that each of the partners bring to the table. Um, so it includes vol trading, systematic trading, quantitative trading, but we like the blend of what is, you know, vol controlled and repeatable with, with having raw beta and, and to the point of this um, webinar, which I, I'm really grateful people are attending and, and we're here for you and to give you truth, facts and wisdom uh, to the extent we can so that you can be empowered with more information. Uh, but we really believe that fundamental selection of portfolios and portfolio diversification and non-correlation between crypto assets is very important. And roughly 30 for 40% of our book is a actively managed long book of crypto assets. So the, the all weather uh, thesis is accomplished by having that, that long book mixed with a plethora of alpha concepts on the systematic and quantitative side. Now, Chris, something else that you said, uh which really made my ears perk up as you were giving your introduction was your sense that the funds who have survived this far in crypto uh, have some background of one kind or another in TradFi or traditional finance. Uh, and as you just spoke to, the various stakeholders at Hyperion uh, have, a, have a wide and very interesting range of those backgrounds. So perhaps both you and Matt, it would be great if you could speak a bit more to how you think about traditional markets, kind of the insights that you've seen from asset management more broadly, uh, maybe even in the days before crypto was something on anyone's minds, uh, and then how you've ported that into thinking about the crypto sector as it's continued to evolve all the way to 23? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we studied the e-cash movement before Bitcoin ever came out. My first exposure to it was actually playing poker in Costa Rica, uh, 2012. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the word traditional is, is really an unfair an opaque word for call it stocks and bonds, right? Because most people don't even have a, a requisite amount of commodity exposure, which are real assets, right? Um, so they're not even markets. There's no real price discovery in them. So it's not even worth talking about them. And I'll, I'll flip to Matt to kind of give a little background on the impetus for our switch. Because I think one thing you point out, Aaron, is the folks that have the tolerance and the, the strength to withstand what we just went through, like arguably three times. The 2022 was a unique uh, bear market for crypto. They, they definitely have a philosophical uh, adherence to these principles in this space, which are decentralization, transparency, and truth through code, that you unless you anchor to the, those principles, you're, you're not going to be as, as able to withstand all of the different um, iterations here. Yeah, and in terms of the philosophical switch, I mean, we were, you know, running vol arb fund, systematic vol arb fund in traditional asset trading the VIX, trading options, et cetera, in a Fed manipulated low ball environment, you know, basically from 2012 and all the way through. But, you know, at 2017, 2018 is where we really dug into crypto and just found it to be refreshing, exciting at every turn. There's a new challenge for me operationally. It never gets <laughs> old. Um, so, you know, there's always a problem to solve, uh, which is a lot different than traditional finance, which has just been completely watered down by you know, all of the above ETFs, you know, uh, Fed intervention, et cetera, et cetera. So. Matt, do you have any favorite anecdotes or stories about some of the uh, most interesting or challenging operational problems to solve? Well, I, I mean, oh, hard. I, I try to just keep my mouth shut because anytime, you know, like I did a podcast in, um, uh, what was it like February, 2023, I was like, oh, you know, it was right after it was announced that BlackRock had invested in Silvergate. And I was like, oh, Silvergate, you know, seems like the turn is here. And uh, so, you know, they're just like, 
at every turn, there's some operational challenge. So, um, I, you know, can't think, can't look too far back or think too far ahead, kind of have to live in the now in crypto. So, yeah, Aaron, I, I would say to Matt's point, like the using two banks that were technologically advanced for a, an algorithmic fund like ours to sp spray across a plethora of, of exchanges, OTCs, counterparties, et cetera, various coins instantaneously 24 seven and programmatically drive that. That was a big, big operational headache. Um, mm. on our, luckily we, we are software engineers on, and, and we're able to recreate that on our end quickly, but that was probably the biggest one from our end because we underwrote it to the degree we could all the counterparties and luckily did not have, you know, FTX at all exposure within the fund. So we're, we're very That's thankful great. for that, but, um, you know, Matt, unless you disagree, I would think that's probably the most annoying and frustrated uh, operational headache we've had. Yeah, it's up there. I mean, you know, last spring, summer wasn't the most fun either. Like, obviously, we, as Chris just mentioned, we avoided FTX exposure. We basically avoided Celsius ex exposure, avoided most Genesis exposure. So, like, kind of avoided all the, the worst mouse traps, but still, uh, you know, you got your guard up the entire time at what's the next shoe to fall in uh, crypto. So, yeah, it's an interesting, I call it a, a array or quiver of hats to be forced to wear as, as, as being a good steward of capital because running and hiding is not part of a, a mandate or investment thesis, right? Underwriting legally, financially, forensically, every single counterparty, every single month, like that, that's not what you know we want to spend all of our day doing but are forced to because of the because of this the space it, it is worthy of our time which the traditional market honestly that's the best way i would answer is not worthy of my capital not worthy of my time mm -hmm. so that's a big point uh, i i want to make but well and the core asset is supposed to be void of all the intermediaries right but you know we're right. not so, there yet to to true full adoption so mm -hmm. That's definitely a lot there that I want to follow up on, uh, perhaps to round out the introductory part of this, especially as we're talking about operations. You know, Jack, from your side, SFOX has spent a lot of time and effort, uh, and you leading SFOX's product have spent a lot of time and effort thinking about how to build solutions to help with, among many other things, the trade execution management uh, and operations of funds uh, and traders such as Hyperion. Could you speak a bit uh, to what it is that SFOX offers uh, and from its perspective as a service provider and a partner, uh, what its philosophy is in terms of helping its clients to succeed in this market and charting their own course? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, you know, Chris and Matt, you guys already kind of hit on a couple of those points. You know, and really in short, I think we try to solve for everything other than you know the the trading strategies themselves for for funds like Hyperion with a, a secure and scalable kind of counterparty. Right? And I think that that starts with kind of uh, you know a secure foundation right of bankruptcy protected custody through SFOX Safe, where you know we focus on mitigating counterparty risk for professionals like Hyperion uh, with regulated and, and insured custody. That's then customizable to you know a, a multi-member team's uh, unique workflows. Um, but then you know as we get into kind of the trade lifecycle, I think you know uh, pre-trade, our you know prime services solution it provides kind of that capital efficiency and ability to gain kind of long short spot exposure that can be you know uh, difficult, especially you know uh, via regulated platform in the U.S. Um, and then at the trade level, right, the the aggregation of global exchange and OTC liquidity into a single order book, uh, so that you know funds can execute trades at scale, um, and you know gain kind of that that advantage and and capitalize on the price discrepancies between between platforms. Um, I think that's that's kind of the the end to end solution that we look to provide, and and yeah, I, I think it really starts with that that counterparty risk point. Um, that you know that Chris and Matt brought up, um, and to that point, you know, Chris Matt, I, I would love to honestly hear a little bit more about how you do evaluate and manage that that counterparty risk. You know, uh, you know the evaluation itself, and then you know uh, amongst kind of the the multiple strategies that you guys are running concurrently. Yeah, Matt, you want to take first step? Well, I mean, we're we're looking at it from a number of different angles. Number one is jurisdictionally, right? That's always been something that we're concerned with to your point about us manager um 
you know, we've, we've typically stayed away from chasing exotic location uh, exchanges, given that there's no recourse whatsoever. Um, and then like internally, we're doing all kinds of measurements of the liquidity order book depth, et cetera, where we can track every different uh, metric there to make sure that that's real tangible um, trading counterparties, et cetera. So, um, and then obviously we're looking at balance sheet doing as much legal due diligence as we can on counterparties. Um, and then typically we require a long-term relationship with a counterparty before we're even doing business with them. I know SFOX's situation, we were, we've been talking to you guys for three years before, you know, ever onboarding and multiple members of the team have a personal relationship with SFOX outside of just doing business. So um, those are all things that really matter to us. Yeah, it's it's kind of just old school underwriting process, right? Where you're, you're underwriting the tech, you're underwriting the structure and, and the human. The easiest part to underwrite um, and the easiest signal to noise ratio is, okay, we, we need tech data. We need spread data. Like L, L3 or level three is, is what most of the quants uh, and market makers call it. Like that, that's the easiest part of the whole the whole role because there's so many different data sets within crypto and then not enough data sets in many aspects uh, from a price price action standpoint that the underwriting of, of transparent data is, is the easiest part of that process. Um, mm. But requirements such as, you know, a, a sandbox UAT environment, uh, test net, all of that is apps, it's a, not even a conversation unless we can test all the fix or API endpoints uh, oftentimes we'll, we'll lead with our HD capital before any LP capital goes on and it, it'll go for 60, 90 days until, until proven to be worthy. And then we're pretty good at breaking stuff. So that's fun when we try to do that. So. <laughs> that's the goal. You don't know how it works until you break it. Yep. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> maybe while we're in that uh, area of inquiry, uh, Chris and Matt, you know, you talked about staying out of some of the, I, I think you called them mouse traps uh, that were sprung for some other market participants <laughs> in the last couple of years, let's say. Um, and Chris, you just, you called out old school underwriting um, versus, you know, maybe something more like the new school approach that other people are inclined to take with crypto where they see it as something that's really soup to nuts novel and requires a totally new perspective. So I wonder just given your background in TradFi um, and now your perspective that, as you said, Chris, you know, you, don't really feel like TradFi is worth your time. Um, what are some of the lessons that you've been able to take from TradFi to crypto? How do you relate them to one another um, when it comes to risk management? Like how much of that is same old, same old versus new things to actual can actually consider? And, you know, uh, on the crypto side, like given that it is so new and that a lot of people, I think, still find the value of a lot of crypto projects a question mark, how do you think about even things like the possibility of value investing or those sorts of like primarily long strategies in the market? So um, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> that, uh, 40 a, minutes, unless I can talk everyone well, into staying longer. Here, here, carry the two. Um, that's a lot to unpack. I'll try and do it quickly for, for the benefit of the audience. Um, let's first tackle the, like the first part of that, right? So the experience we've all had and, and our elder partners were in, you know, the, the 2000, well, 98 long-term capital management crisis, then to 2000, 2001 bear. I, I was on the floor of Morgan Stanley during the financial, so-called financial crisis, because I, I would call it the, the fraud crisis. Um, you know, and so what that, that taught us was how to spot BS, very honestly. And, and then you can look at, okay, these MMMing or LPing projects are basically like, tokenomics incentives to create activity on this BS useless, no use case, already high valuation project that then under these unlocks that are scheduled that are also transparent, which I like that part actually, um, you know, we're gonna erode value over time. And then the inflation rate of the, that unlock and sale or new token issuance is more than the stake yield. And it's it, it's just this, this very transparent to us, but opaque to participants who don't know to, to look for it. Way to go. Okay, uh, not not investable, right? Okay, we're we're pretty decent at tech underwriting, so we can avoid uh, and expose places that might have 
uh, probability of worm or bridge hacks, protocols that are weak, uh, shared security uh, that's broken down across blockchains or just not even there across blockchains, like a lot of trying to share at ETH security, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, so it's it's really underwriting in general. And then because the the you know banking system at all and the securitization process, all of that requires you to do a ton of underwriting to know what you're buying. Really, that's why you don't assume fraud. Uh, it just turns out that most products are that. Um, so that really prepared us to at least get out of the way of most of the harm um, and having permanent loss, not based on strategy or, or being wrong fundamentally. Um, and then on value, I was just describing part of the way to value assets, right? But there, there's a lot of more tools now than when we started, as Matt said, in 17, right? We started there's six, eight assets, right? Um, and, and there was a big fight, you know, with B, BCH, BSV, this is the forks of, of Bitcoin. And that was a whole debate. And, and this, this space is rife with narrative when it's intended to be self-sovereignty and indestructible code, which it is, and, and indestructible store value. Um, so the process we went through in our earlier part of the career led us to underwrite the, this as technologists, as contrarian value investors, and we're natural bears. So it's it's a skeptic until proven otherwise. Um, but with the tool sets like Token Terminal, for example, you can underwrite protocols from a valuation perspective. Um, you can look at traffic, you can look at wallet, then you can look at first and second derivatives of wallets, the rate of change, right? Uh, all of those lead into how we look at valuations and anybody who tells you you can't come up with that, especially in fiat that's constantly deflating at double digits per year forever until it goes to zero, um, you absolutely can. Um, I can pick apart more metrics, but Matt, I'm sure you want to jump in with with some others. No, I think you answered most of it there. I mean, that, that was a pretty lengthy uh, question. Yeah, so. <laughs> I went as fast as I could. I, I felt like that was very succinct, but I'm also yeah. a long-winded guy, so I know your audience. Uh, I love that word you bring up, though, narrative, Chris. I think especially in the crypto world, it's a very provocative one. Uh, and given spaces out there like crypto Twitter or you know Telegram or anything else you might want to call out that is rife with narrative um, as institutional investors in the space, how do you filter through that narrative uh, and the noise that it creates to find the signal? Is oh. it primarily leaning on those sorts of valuation tools you talked about? Are there other I mean, ways to one, get I don't have around either it? of those. I don't have Twitter. Or there you Twitter. go. So, All right. <laughs> you don't listen to the narratives in well, the first place. I don't even see the damn narrative. Um, so that's <laughs> one, one thing. I, I mean, we're just laser focused. Like our mandate is a combination of non-correlated alphas in a systematic way Diverse across, diversified across time horizon, expected value, expected return, expected loss, et cetera, on a range of tokens diversified by sector and by potential upside uh, that have to be agnostically overweighted to liquidity and market cap. So it's not like super sophisticated, but it is very disciplined and process driven because it has mm. to. Um, we don't like all, like for example, Solana, we like it. They've gone through a lot. They've recovered. The, the transaction value locked has has increased. They didn't, you know, blow out of their positions. The wallets look great. Everything looks great now, and they earn their stripes, so to speak, as a team and as a protocol. So therefore, that gets a, a larger equity position than let's say it did when they first came out. However, we can't project out into the future the same way we can Bitcoin, which only has twenty one million ever. And then Ethereum, where 100% of issuance is currently out there. This is all you're going to get, folks. And it's real mm -hmm. yield, including the, the burn, is about 6 7%. It's the only asset on the planet like that. So, you know, it's given you kind of both ends of the quant systematic side blended with the fundamental side. I like that soundbite of simple discipline. I think uh, th that as much as anything is a good way for perhaps people who are engaged with the narratives to cut through a bit of it. Um, I, I will take a, a quick break at this point, just to remind our dear audience that we're about halfway through. So if you find yourself coming up with questions for our esteemed panelists, uh, don't be shy and don't be selfish. Don't keep them to yourself. Put them in the chat box. Um, Jack, perhaps we can pivot back to the SFOX platform for a moment. Um, we've heard how Hyperion Decimus uh, is multi-strategy. Uh, one of the strategies that they deploy on SFOX is high-frequency trading. And so I was wondering whether you could speak a bit 
to the value prop, especially for high frequency traders through SFOX's platform. Uh, I might imagine some people thinking, look, SFOX connects me to all these different trading venues, but if I have to route to all of those different venues, does that run risk of slowing me down or make it harder to execute my strategy at scale? Um, could you speak to how the product and infrastructure philosophy of SFOX works to empower those sorts of traders? Yeah, I think, you know, starting kind of at a, a higher level, you know, for kind of a multi-strat firm like Hyperion, obviously very important to be able to run multiple strategies concurrently on a single platform as well. Uh, so, you know, our our platform enables, you know, uh, that via kind of our uh, separately managed accounts solution, right? So Hyperion can manage multiple accounts, each with their own you know, trading strategy and allocate assets between them. Uh, but then, yeah, Aaron, I think that's you know, a great point. Kind of jumping into the lower level latency piece right we're we're in a global uh, crypto asset class with you know exchanges all over the world counterparties all over the world and you know sfox is connecting to each one aggregating it all from kind of a single venue um so yes there there's certainly you know a variance in, in latency kind of you know across each venue just you know by by nature of the physical distance between you know servers um and, and with that, right, we have to live by kind of an every millisecond counts mentality, right? Uh, there's, and, you know, overall, there's, there can be very minimal impact, if at all, in, you know, kind of adding that extra step of SBOX between, you know, end destination counterparty, but there's no way kind of around that initial piece. So uh, really our focus is on streamlining, you know, the back end execution, right? Uh, you know, uh, kind of, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is to kind of solve for everything other than the trading strategy. So that's, you know, how can we get as close to our counterparty uh, destinations as possible physically so that we can remove, you know, that latency for our clients. Um, and that's kind of the role that we take on as, you know, kind of the, the execution service provider on the back end, right? Hyperion doesn't have to worry about that. We have a whole team that's focused on how can we get you know these trades executed as quickly as possible and reliably as possible to get them you know the price that they're trying to execute at? Um, but yeah, I guess you know we're uh, we're kind of jumping into a, a bit of a lower level conversation, and you know with that, I know you know Hyperion, Matt, Chris, we we talk about this a lot together. Um, I'm very interested in in kind of how uh, you value execution, what you focus on. I'm sure that varies by strategy, but. Uh, yeah, maybe could you speak to you know, some of the factors that you guys consider there? Yeah, it's you know we we have market making discipline, and obviously we have low latency strategies as part of the, the alpha driver because typically they're delta neutral. Um, so execution quality is of paramount uh, importance on our end. How how we measure that really, I would say more more so than slippage, which is one of the ways, is markouts and fill rates. Meaning if we're going to put $1 at risk to buy $1 worth of Bitcoin, what, what market out and fill rate percentage occurs and what is the, the, the recurrence of that, right? And so we've been collecting that data for a long, long time. Um, it's not, none of it's really perfect, but, you know, if you know deep, deeply what the dark pools on the equity markets are, then, you know, you, you wouldn't really even crit, be critical of this. So, um you know, it's it's just a combination of things where we're looking to make sure we're capital efficient. We're, we're, we use our own in-house execution algorithm, so we never cross the spread. All the orders are making, so we never really have a, a, an annoying amount of slippage. But cost, speed, and then fill rate are, are really the most important things because if, if we're not getting filled at 100% of our signal, then we're missing out on, on the potential gain of that signal. I love that. I think that's a really great perspective. We we definitely got into the uh, the lower level weeds a bit, as you said, Jack. So now I want to correct that by zooming Sorry. way out. And at, no, 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 weeds are good, uh, but also good to see the forest for the trees. So thankfully, we have some questions for that. Um, guys, I'm curious, Chris and Matt, you know, obviously you're running this fund that is crypto focused, but in terms of portfolio management, more broadly speaking, right, if I'm someone who's managing a fund and thinking about investing across asset classes and seeing crypto as one allocation. What, if anything, do you see as the right way to think about using crypto within a broader portfolio? And especially now that crypto has had the staying power to be around for a number of years, and we've seen you know, market cycles on various scales come and go, 
Um, how would one think about managing that in a portfolio across those market cycles? Sure. Matt, you want to? I think this is a little more up your alley, quite honestly. So, yeah, uh, you know, I nothing I get to, you know, to say here is pretty. Um, I would. <laughs> so the game is, ladies and gentlemen, the game is he or she who gets out of fiat fastest into assets wins, right? And then, okay, what are what's the difference between asset and liability? Well, a bond's a liability, so that's negative money. And then stocks aren't stocks anymore for a bazillion reasons. One being, wait. Instead of investing in plants and people, we're buying back 25% of our stock. And that I'm I'm not hundred percent sure it's it's that exact number, but it's probably 24.1 since 2008. It's been bought back by companies. That's a self-liquidation. Any investor who wants to invest in a self-liquidating company, good luck, because that's not a long-term success plan. So to me, it's commodities, 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 right? What are commodities? A building, residential home, oil, gold, silver, lithium, you know, um, intellectual property is a type of commodity and so is crypto so if we're just going off your traditional correlations and and sharp increases you can't justifiably do your fiduciary duty unless you are 15 percent allocated to crypto and soon and i know this from speaking to lawyers there are going to be lawsuits against you know fiduciaries who have not recommended bitcoin and crypto uh, because the return profile of this asset class when looking at five year and ten year charts so, you know is so much more than any other you are then negligent on your your duty as a fiduciary so to me there's like the bare minimum is is 15 percent ish but if if you're really trying to protect wealth grow wealth you really need to put this in, in, in the perspective of which ones of these crypto assets are commodities truly and then how can i deploy an effective amount of capital to meet my mandate of xyz percentage Wow, that's huge. And maybe it's something that is not that surprising to people who are already down the crypto rabbit hole, but this idea that uh, it's actually inconsistent with one's fiduciary duty not to explore, or recommend, or invest in crypto. And you've also kind of missed the boat if you're just thinking about crypto for the first time, as opposed to which particular cryptos um, serve one's needs as a commodity uh, and within one's portfolio. That uh, that's definitely a a bold perspective, I think. <laughs> I mean, the truth is bold. So, um, you know, you, the, the technology offers everything from lowering B2B transaction costs to next to nothing to protecting value to, I mean, Ethereum is like the Apple App Store and Android times infinity, right? Mm. For free for developers and without any oligarchy or monopolistic overtones to it. So you, you really need to kind of dive in and do the token taxonomy and understand how to meet your mandates as, as fiduciary. And then more, more, more importantly, as investors, right? Um, this isn't going to be measured in fiat forever either. While we're on the subject of market cycles, Jack, I'd love to get your perspective on the other side of this too. You know, I, I know you've put a lot of thought into the development of SFOX's product suite, as you said earlier, as something that's end to end and can really serve the sophisticated and even multi-strategy needs of companies uh, and funds like Hyperion. Um, as you think about the development roadmap for SFOX uh, in terms of not just managing strategies at a single point in the market, but actually across these market cycles uh, and greater longitudinal trajectories, especially when we have Chris talking about how kind of unbelievable the value prop of crypto is as an asset class, longitudinally speaking, where you don't get that from any other asset classes. How do you think about that in terms of the solution or solutions that you're building for these sorts of institutional clients? That's a great question. I think the really, uh, we do have to take the time to try to kind of look and and stay ahead and and you know, essentially predict uh, where we think the market will be you know uh, a year two years from now uh, you know in in the height of a bull market right that might be thinking about what's going to be important to our clients if you know the market suddenly changes and you know we, we shift into a bear market um, you know most recently I think the the example of that would be uh, you know our launch of you know the SFOX safe, Custody solution, right? We're we're kind of in the midst of um, you know all of these you know, very popular uh, potential counterparties for investors, you know, uh, failing, and you know there is, there is uh, really poor kind of both understanding of 
you know, who is in control of assets and own the, owns those assets when they're sitting on, you know, a, a particular platform um, and what kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, resources that a, an investor has to, to recoup those assets if the platform does indeed fail. Um, and we saw that as, you know, a, an opportunity to uh, really set more of an industry standard, right? That, that you know, secure custody should be kind of the, the beginning of any uh, strong long-term relationship with a client uh, or investor. And, and that, you know, uh, they shouldn't face that, that counterparty risk. I think this is something that tends to be you know, essentially taken for granted, I guess, in, in traditional markets, right? Custody just kind of happens in your, you know, brokerage account or you know, where you're trading. Um, but in crypto, yeah, it's- How do you it's deal more... with qualified custody in, you know, crypto exactly. moving forward, especially 18 months from now, if there's a qualified custodian rule update, so. Yeah, I, Matt, that's I mean, a great point too, kind of navigating a you know, ever shifting and gray regulatory environment too, but to still be able to provide kind of that, uh, that legal and, and uh, compliance structure for, for clients where we can. I think, you know, we, we got our trust license in the state of Wyoming where, you know, they had, you know, very clear kind of uh, digital asset uh, stipulations, which we think is a, you know, a huge advantage and, and love working with the state to, to kind of further that initiative. Uh, but yeah, I think that's, you know, uh, maybe you know, Hyperion, you guys are, are thinking about, you know, how asset allocations and, and allocations between strategies is shifting as kind of, as we go through market cycles, we're kind of just, you know, trying to take the same approach, but apply it to, you know, the products and services that we're building for clients. Um, but yeah, definitely very curious to hear uh, Hyperion's perspective on kind of uh, uh, shifting with, with market cycles as well. And guys, maybe this is actually a good segue into our first Q and A uh, outreach. So shout out to the anonymous attendee who broke the seal on that, because mm -hmm. that is also all about regulation. Namely, what are your thoughts? And I'll put this to the whole group on the regulatory environment, such as the markets in crypto assets regulation in the EU or similar initiatives in the U.S. Um, Mika and then the, its predecessor in Liechtenstein are are pretty pretty solid in terms of their delineation specifications and taxonomy um, ranking and, and really just de defining what, what these different assets uh, taxonomy is. So I think that's a great precedent. Um, the US is embarrassing. And, and then in the MENA region and obviously recently Hong Kong, uh, Asia region, uh, it's not as transparent, but I, I know there's been investments in sort of the, the Web3 movement um, at Singapore level. Hong Kong for retail trading went on Sunday, I believe, if not Monday. Um, yeah, and Hong Kong has outlined, you know, 10 or so assets that meet their mandate, if you will. Yeah, I think, I mean, right, A, it's something, right? It's, but, it, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a standard that's applicable kind of throughout the EU, which is, you know, incredibly kind of powerful for, uh, you know, uh, platforms like ourselves that, you know, that, are, you know, are looking to kind of expand uh, geographically. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it really just, you know, it's a starting point uh, that hopefully, you know, other regions and, and you know, hopefully the U.S., Chris, yeah, too, kind of, uh, you know, takes the, takes as the lead. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's very exciting and uh, would love, you know, would love our chief compliance officer, John uh, Menino, to, uh, to opine on this. I know he's, he's very excited as well, but uh, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, I think the, the, there's been way too much conversation about regulation. It matters not. Um, they do not prevent anything. The things that I would be concerned about are consumer protections first, rule of law behind that to make sure the courts and judicial system provide investors and, and technologists, et cetera, where recoup losses and assets, et cetera, in the normal process, whether you're a bank or you're a hedge fund or you're a mutual fund or ETF, right? All of that should be congruent and and prioritized to protect customers, right? It shouldn't be- And made transparent to the customer. Right? Correct. And, yeah. and luckily through code, you could see all of that. And you guys have actually done a commendable job as far as the simplicity and low obsolescence of SAFE. Like it's, this is what it is. We've done all the right things to have the accoutrements of the Wyoming blessing, the technology, and, and we're trusted and transparent to place assets with. So that even that is solving enough in my opinion, but investors, are not going to get a green light ever. Like that's not what regulatory environments do. They react and exact and extract fees from bad actors or medium actors to keep their engines going. 
there's not been one preventative move by regulation as far as fraud, waste, and abuse is concerned in our entire history. So I, I would argue there are only going to be more and more you know, buildup of opportunity before the adoption rate really kicks off and investors should at least you know, be cognizant of that and, and start their underwriting and at least start deploying some capital there. So Chris, it, it sounds like in, in some cases, you worry about regulation as more of an obstacle to transparency and the actual consumer protections that matter at the end of the day versus something that's productive or conducive to market performance. Is that something that you see as like particular to the crypto sector or just no, that, that's regulation not, and that's financial markets more broadly? Aaron, that's not subjective. That is objective fact, right? Like, the, you, you, have you ever read one of the bills? Like, good, the only good one was Glass-Steagall, right? And and everything else is laughable. And they're this thick, written by lobbyists and lawyers who are maybe just out of law school that don't know anything. And, and it, it just doesn't accomplish anything. You can write the rules on one page of what you need. So the mm. complexity is so that players that can afford armies of attorneys, accountants, and lobbyists get to really do whatever they want, and those who don't can't. That's the that's that's what it is. So it's not my subjective opinion. It is fact that what you said is the case. I like this idea of, oh, please go ahead. No, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think one thing, oh, too, that's, that, that's important there is, you know, if you take the whole, you know, it, are crypto assets uh, securities or not securities out of out of the question? Like Chris, I think I think you brought up a great point about you know, investor protections, right? And in that case, I think it's it's kind of lost that those rules and regulations and licenses and and you know how to be compliant there and and how to protect your own clients, like those are pretty well laid out, right? And that that's true across industries. Um, so yeah, I think you know that that kind of gets clouded with the whole you know uh, gray area that's that's going on now and and the narrative, uh, Chris, that you probably yeah may or may not be aware of given uh, lack of Twitter. Uh, but yeah, I think that's that's something that that is a bit lost and and incredibly important uh, to realize too um, that yeah you, you know these companies do have a clear path to uh, to you know protect their their own clients uh, you know from their own platform. Uh, and yeah, I think that that is important to kind of set a, as a standard with, uh, you know, across the industry. And to yeah, and Jack, I think we've touched on other conversations at the bar for crypto companies complying or instituting those type of standards is actually quite a bit higher than most other businesses, given what we've got to, you know, deal with on the banking side and et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, and you, you also have various blue sky laws at the state level and, and then obviously the commerce clause that do govern these things anyway so i think like if you look at what would be a, a corollary historically or another analog is you know the dot-com boom and then really even the telecom boom the regulation didn't catch up to that for nine ten years right especially version web two with, with regards to social media um and you've had F fcc sec etc cftc everybody at all get involved and take a, a really long time to get any so, sort of clarity of sets of rules down. So investors are going to be overly burdened by this so-called narrative. Oh, oh we, we crypto needs regulatory clarity. It doesn't. It has it. Look at the code. Like if you want to assume their securities and commodities at the same time to be safe. Great. That's what we do, too. And, and comply across the board. I love this conversation, gentlemen. I want to switch gears just very slightly, um, but still, I guess, in the spirit of transparency and finding um, signal as opposed to noise, we have a few data questions. Some are my own, but we got another uh, introduction <laughs> oh, from the from the Q and A, which will be good. Um, someone who actually is part of an institutional grade market data provider. Um, so this participant writes first, thank you all for your comments and honest opinions, greatly appreciated. So there you go, sounding the truth to people already appreciated. Chris, Matt, you're doing your job. <laughs> um, <laughs> you mentioned the lack of data sets from a price action standpoint. How big of a challenge is that in your day-to-day -day and across your various strategies? What are the main hurdles that need to be overcome there across centralized finance and decentralized finance in your view? So long-winded answer again, but let me let me start with an example. So uh, if you look at the charts of SPACs, right, um, they go like this, 
and then grind as on their way to zero. A lot of crypto assets look like that. Some defunct IPOs look like that. Mm. Uh, a lot of CDOs and CLOs from vintage uh, 06, or especially Q1 of 07, as the banks unloaded their BS to the unknowing investors, um, they, they, those price action charts look exactly like that. And, and essentially, we need, more importantly, in addition to the understanding of historical analogs, is duration. So not mm -hmm. enough sets. We're specifically meaning on an asset like Arbitrum, which we really, really like. Like, yeah. On sophisticated quant strategies, we need infinity data points so that when we're doing machine learning and ranking factors one to 10, or we're, we're doing a point in time model and combining momentum with trend following and some sort of stat arb, the factors have to have their own probabilities and the signals have to not be filled with noise and be accurate on their forward predictions. Yeah, I, we prefer like maybe two cycles full of data, you know, two to three years is what we're really looking for, which not many assets have that. So, right. And, and like on, on another big L1 that we were, were fans of, like Avalanche, they have cycle one up and, and cycle two down and, and potentially starting cycle three up, right? So the, it's not even a completed two cycle yet. So um, that's why we're, we're borrowing alpha concepts from the traditional space to be um, good enough for rock and roll. But as far as getting more and more sophisticated uh, to drive more nuanced alpha, uh, we, we we definitely need larger price history data sets. Uh, with respect to DeFi, there's ac actually infinity data sets and you have to dive in and have an assumption going in. Okay, well, I'm going to look at the spread between the LPing and, and the token issuance. That Let's call that 6%. And then how does that work on an annualized basis to decay the, the, pro, the value of the token? And then how much inflow do you need per month or annualized to offset that? Like then you can really go down a rabbit hole and parse out that data ad nauseum. Um, so I, I think from the, the blockchain side of things, there's unbelievable quantities of data that people really aren't doing good enough job analyzing and, par and compartmentalizing. Um, some mm -hmm. groups like Into the Block and, and, and Glassnode it, it, and others are at least tracking it. But I think it's it's just as exploratory. The wanderlust is definitely massive on our end um, to, to dive in there and try and understand what these data sets mean because they're reflecting human behavior in a way that we haven't seen before. And yeah, and, and to your point on narrative, narrative now, uh, <laughs> some of the regulatory narrative has driven, you know, alt liquidity near all time lows. And so that's skewing the data, especially from we've, you know, just yesterday we got <laughs> a notice that trading pairs in uh, one of the most, the oldest exchanges were being eliminated in most of the top alts. So, you know, that is constantly skewing data on our side as well. Yeah, good, good, good point, Matt. Uh, Chris, you brought up an interesting point about you know, the kind of lack of history in, in price action data. And, you know, for some of these tokens, right, there's only so much history and, you know, there's no way to kind of backfill that. Uh, do you ever kind of take an analog between between tokens to try to, you know, uh, create more of a history? Oh, when we've tried to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not been the most successful when we've, <laughs> we've tried it. So, I mean, there was a, a period where we kind of correlated every L1 to ETH and uh, that looked decent in a back test, but live never matched anything close to the back test. And then we were approached with a pretty interesting stat R model on the L1s versus ETH. And when we tore it apart, we found it was kind of garbage, but. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's an interesting point too, Matt. Uh, you know, you, you kind of talked about, uh, you know, uh, back testing and then uh, you know trying out a new a new strategy. How, how do you guys think about uh, the process of bringing a new strategy to life? You know, within the fund, is that yeah? Uh, what are kind of the steps yeah. along the way? I mean, there, there's constant development, Jack. And I think to to point it because people often ask the wrong question, like why does this happen? Right. The the right question is how, and then you have to look at mechanics. So what Matt was pointing out, I'll, I'll frame in to answer your question all right so why you know does this do that when that is is wrong how it does it is okay we have captive uh constituents on let's say binance or dbank or crypto.com right that can only trade a hundred thousand dollars of 
pick a pick a token or or and then there so only 20 percent of them are willing to sell no matter what the buy orders that come into the order book so there are nuances on the mechanical side that show that how actually if you ask how and understand the mechanics it then explains exactly what matt was touching on and what you're touching on in terms of strategy development we have to be cognizant of the fact that there's jurisdictional separation of capital you're not just trading at gsec or on the nisey where you're basically playing in my account arbitrage because nothing actually freaking settles and no one actually owns their shares of apple because it goes through dtc's and I, I won't diatribe on that but you know there's no actual ownership there it's just playing with the computer screen um, these assets actually have to move wallets. So, you know, being cognizant of that um, is very important to strategy development. We're constantly testing because we see data that comes out and we're, and we're taking from, you know, uh, multiple vaults of awareness on how to construct and test quantitative systematic strategies. And there's a lot of fun in the testing and development side once you understand what, what game you're playing and how the mechanical side matters as much as the logic side. Now, guys, I, I have a follow-up question from the audience here, and then I have a few more that I'm going to try to grind through in a timely manner. So bear with me. And we have, if we have to lightning round some of this stuff, I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me that. Uh, so the follow-up question first is um, following up on Chris, your response to the last question. Um, the same attendee asks, how much should it drive your decision making, um, looking at markets who seem to have a radically different amount of market participants and AUM from year one to year two. How relevant do you think those sorts of figures and growth are even in nascent markets or tokens? I mean, it's not not important. Um, it, it definitely has to be factored in, in, into the matrix. Uh, but as far as, you know, specifically on a token, what we're looking at, that's different than what we're looking at for a systematic or quantitative strategy, right? So we're looking for order book depth, spread narrow, um, low slippage, and and the ability to participate across multiple venues, right? For a, a token's fundamental on-chain attributes, those requirements are totally different. And and yes, I, I specifically have subjective ones that I like, but our team has developed everything from a smart contract rating a process to a DeFi scoring process. And, and yes, if, if waning participants on uh, specifically on the dev side, which you can research on GitHub, however, FYI, mm. GitHub can be spoofed for those who are devs on this call. Um, we, we absolutely prioritize that as, as part of it. Cause a lot of the builds on builds, right. Are, are essentially use cases for 70 to hundred developers. That's not something that should command a multi-billion dollar valuation in our opinion, not that it couldn't. Um, but that it at least shouldn't currently. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. That, uh, that is yeah, I, I should say so. Hopefully it does. Um, to round out the, the data portion of the conversation, Jack, I wanted to just kick things specifically to you because I know you and I are on the horn basically every other day at this point talking about all the efforts you're making to uh, make available and analyzable new sorts of data sets as part of SFOX's asset managed suite. Um, in kind of in the context of this conversation about finding signal versus noise uh, and creating um, not only available data sets, but stuff that can actually be utilized in trading strategies, uh, how do you approach the question of which data sets to integrate into the platform and how to surface those for users? Yeah, I think, you know, as you've heard from Chris and Matt, data and specifically kind of actionable insights are incredibly important to you know, running any uh, trading strategy, especially uh, when it comes to systematic trading. Um, I think, you know, uh, SFOX is in a, a unique position in that by kind of aggregating liquidity and counterparties, uh, we ha also have a kind of unique uh, perspective and access to data. So, you know, even a basic example, right, is, uh, you know, rather than a singular kind of exchange price action data set for a particular token or pair, right, you're, you have the same data set, but across all of those, you know, uh, you know public and, and kind of private destinations. Uh, even, you know, again, something as simple as, you know, the current price of a particular asset, um, you know, because we're aggregating kind of trades data, 
you get more of an index price than you know a uh, kind of uh, uh, you know highly kind of fluctuating uh, single exchange uh, current price. Uh, but overall, I think it's it's really more again you know speaking to kind of the longer term partnerships that we look to build with clients, working with uh, you know clients like Hyperion to understand what is valuable, how we can help, and how we can. Uh, use both, you know, the data that we're already ingesting to, you know, create these data sets or explore other areas that, you know, uh, that our clients find valuable. I love that. Now, gentlemen, as we're wrapping up in the last three minutes, I want to put uh, basically two versions of the same question uh, in front of you three fellows, one from the Hyperion side and one from the SFOX side, because I think I think there's this sentiment amongst some market participants when it comes to crypto that there's kind of a division of labor or division of interests between kind of Web3 and the builders of the world and the people who are developing these companies and trying to create value um, in new verticals uh, versus the investors who are trying to generate alpha or use asset management and treat crypto as a portfolio allocation. Um, but kind of seeing it more as an abstract asset or instrument versus um, a network of entrepreneurs who are building different things. And so with that kind of model in mind, I want to ask you Hyperion guys, you know, how do you think about the intersection of building and contributing to lasting value in the sector and generating alpha? And then Jack, from your side, from the SFOX perspective, as you build a lot of these tools for asset management, how does that in your mind, integrate with the philosophy of building value in the crypto sector on an ongoing basis? Um, Aaron, the job of short sellers to destroy what needs to be destroyed is very, very important. So I don't actually delineate between the developers and, and the investors because it, honestly, the, all the developers are, are usually using investor money to develop. So they're, they're kind of one and the same factually, right? And, and I think it's important, unlike in the, in the TradFi space where you beat a dead horse like we work all the way to zero, here you have destruction almost instantly. When something doesn't work, and honestly, the developers and the people in the space, oftentimes, um, especially when you sub out the, the outliers like a SBF, they're the best, most talented people on earth, both ethically and, and from a skill set standpoint. So if, if what they're doing is not real, really having use case uh, adoption or value creation, then there is a pivot. And, and we've seen that amongst projects um, that are out today. So I, I don't delineate. I think there's a natural um, harm or symbiotic relationship yeah. um, that, that both benefit from. Right. Like the investors should not ignore the developers, you know, pie in the sky ideas about disruption, decentralization, et cetera. And at the same time, the developers should not ignore the investors, the astute adherence to process and principle and, and creation and destruction of capital. And I would say, you know, on the on the SFOX side, Aaron, uh, we're kind of in a, a similar position, right? Where uh, yes, we want to kind of further decentralization, and that's what you know all this space is all about. Uh, but you know, we are a, a centralized platform, uh, you know, for you know uh, professional clients. Uh, so how do we, uh, yeah, how, how do we kind of uh, uh, commingle th those two concepts, right? And I think you know, uh, really, our goal is to you know bridge uh, any remaining gaps. Uh, to make it easy uh, for professionals to enter the crypto space with a vertically integrated solution. Um, we think, you know, things like access to Web3 is a critical part of that, right? Um, you know, beyond just uh, trading, even, you know, participation, right? Staking, governance, uh, these are all, uh, these are all very valuable parts of, of the ecosystem and our product offering as a whole. Uh, but that, that's a, a product of our incentives also being aligned with our clients, right? We are we are gaining value if our clients are generating returns or extracting value from the space. Um, and so, the more that we can, uh, you know, provide kind of you know a, a safe and secure and and you know institutional kind of access point to that ecosystem, I think the more you know both SFOX and its clients will benefit from from the asset class as a whole. 
tremendously illuminating perspectives uh, for my two cents from both sides of the table uh, and a wonderful note on which to end. Apologies for running a minute over, uh, but we can wrap things up now. I want to first and foremost thank our uh, peerless participants, Chris, Matt, and Jack. Really, I know I learned a lot uh, just from your edifying and really honest perspectives in terms of your participation in the sector. I think it's safe to say our audience did too. Thank you to our audience, uh, not just for being so engaged, but for uh, actually asking some really probative questions. Uh, I enjoyed those too, and I know it made the overall webinar uh, a lot more substantive and illuminating. Uh, I invite you all to keep an eye on your inboxes as well, because we'll be sending along the recording of this, which you're free to access and share any time after this. Uh, and if you're interested in learning any more about SFOX or Hyperion or their perspectives on the market, I'll make it easier for you to do that as well. Um, but with that, a final thank you, um, Chris, Matt, Jack. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, and I'm looking forward to doing more of this for the SFOX community, broadly speaking, uh, and, and helping everyone figure out how to treat the, uh, the crypto asset class with the sophistication that it deserves. So thank you, gentlemen.